Hi everyone, I'm Teresa Torres, and today I'll be talking about product managers and product owners. This is a topic that's come up quite a bit for me in the last few weeks. I've had several companies ask me, should they be hiring product managers? Should they be hiring product owners? Do they need both? Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about these two roles, the differences, and what they mean in terms of where you are in your own journey towards a continuous discovery process. So for those of you that aren't familiar with my background, I work as a product discovery coach. I teach teams all over the world a structured and sustainable approach to continuous discovery. And today's content is really gonna build on what I've seen from working with teams in all different places in their journey towards a more continuous discovery practice. So let's start at the beginning and we're gonna start with what I often refer to as traditional product management. Now, this is where product management was really grounded for many, many decades. Um, we still see um, most companies um, rooted in this model in one way, shape or form. In uh, a traditional company, a product manager sits in the middle between business stakeholders and the engineering team. Now, typically what the product manager is doing is they're working with business stakeholders to figure out, to gather requirements. So in this model, the business stakeholders are making decisions about what to build. The product manager is working with them to make those, to turn those decisions into viable software. And then the product manager turns around, writes typically long requirements documents and then hands that off to the rest of the team. This is often what we call a traditional waterfall model, right? Where the product manager gathers requirements, documents them, a designer designs to those requirements, and the engineers build to those requirements and to those designs. Now, the reason why this is considered the old way of working, even though many of you may still work this way, is because we see a lot of challenges in this model. Um, there's one concept I wanna introduce right away, and that's one that Marty Kagan often uses this analogy of mercenary teams versus missionary teams. He argues that we want our missionary teams of engineers. So let's talk about the difference. A mercenary team is one that is really an order taker. They're being told to build something specific and they're just building exactly what they were asked to build. Whereas a missionary team is being tasked with a mission. Here's an objective we're trying to reach and they join the team, buy into the mission and are delivering higher quality software. And really what we want is every business wants high quality software. So our goal is to, is to drive for missionary teams. Now this model, unfortunately, really encourages um, mercenary teams. And the reason why is that you can see that the requirements are coming from business stakeholders. And that's, there's nothing wrong with business stakeholders sharing what they think the business needs. In fact, that's their job. But when we let business stakeholders define software requirements, we're letting the people furthest away from the technology decide what to build. And they don't always have the requisite knowledge to write good product requirements. So what happens is when the engineers are building something and they realize something wasn't designed quite right, um, it's not quite possible, they're so far away from the business stakeholders and their real needs that, and they've been trained to just be mercenaries, that they just build what they're told even if they know it's not gonna be good. We don't want that. We want our engineers to be engaged in the process and giving us feedback because they're the closest to the technology. They know what's possible. So what we saw um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, was we saw the adoption of um, a method that's often associated with Agile, but actually predates Agile, and that's Scrum. So in the Scrum model, we're, we're trying to um, solve a couple of these problems. So first of all, Scrum refers to pro um, labeled that middle um, go between role as the product owner. So that's where we see that second term come up. And you can see here, the product owner is still gathering requirements, but in Scrum, the product owner is really meant to be the voice of the customer. So they're gathering requirements from the customer. They're still writing requirements, but they're working in much smaller iterations. So instead of writing long product requirements documents that might represent months worth of work, they're typically writing user stories and they're working in one or two week increments often called a sprint. Now we get a few benefits with Scrum right away. Um, obviously writing shorter requirements, working in, in faster iterations uh, means that we can um, get feedback from customers more often in theory, although I've met plenty of scrum teams that don't get feedback from customers after each sprint. Um, but the intent here was if we work in smaller increments, we can get feedback from customers more often and we can course correct as needed. Now you can see here though, the product owner is still just gathering requirements. So in this model, 
the customer is deciding what to build. Now, sometimes the customer is those very same business stakeholders, right? If we're building internal to tools, those business stakeholders are still making the decisions about, about what to build. Sometimes the customers are end users, but in either case, it's not necessarily true that our stakeholders or our customers are, in, are experts on what's possible with technology. So you can see the engineering team is still pretty far removed from the decisions about what to build. So we're not turning them into missionaries. They're still mercenaries, um, and we're still not going to get that high quality we're looking for. Now, another, a number of teams have pushed the envelope even further, especially in the last 15 years, and they're moving to a trio-based model of um, discovery. So when we use the term discovery, we're just talking about who makes the decisions, so in this, about what to build. So in this case, you can see we've replaced that product manager or product owner with a product trio, and the product trio is working with customers. Now, the reason why I call this project-based discovery is you can see the product trio is iterating with customers. They're still writing those requirements, and they're handing them off to the team. So there's still sort of this handoff. We're still trying to take a complex product or service and translate it into requirements with engineers. Engineers are still removed from the discovery process. So we're not solving all of the problems, but what we are seeing in this model is that customers are much more involved in the process. Our product trio is no longer gathering requirements. They're bringing their technology expertise and they're working with customers to iterate on their ideas. So we're, customers are bringing the knowledge of their context, the product trio is bringing the knowledge of technology, and they're co-creating better solutions. So that's great. The left-hand side on this map looks really good. The challenge we run into with project-based discovery is sometimes this team on the left can move really fast and they're just loading the team on the right with a ton of requirements and the team on the right can't keep up. Other times we see the other uh, the opposite happen where discovery is taking a long time, it's, t it's hard to get the prototype just right, we're not exactly sure what to build, and the team on the right is sitting um, waiting for more work. So what happens when these cadences get out of sync, um, uh, companies start to think about should we have a product discovery team and a product delivery team? Maybe if discovery is too slow, we have many discovery teams that have one delivery team. If delivery is too slow, maybe we have one discovery team and lots of delivery teams. Um, and so we start to think about separating these roles. The problem when we do that is we're starting to reintroduce, reintroduce these handoffs that we saw in that more traditional product management model, which we don't want to do. We actually want to bring the engineering team closer to the discovery, not further away from the discovery. The other problem with this model, where the trio is doing the discovery together and they're writing requirements and handing them off to the engineering team, is the product manager often gets overwhelmed. What happens is they spend a ton of time co-creating with customers, but they're still being asked to write these really detailed requirements, so they're also spending a ton of time in delivery. They're grooming backlogs, they're going to all the sprint ceremonies, they're, they have to be available to answer all the engineers' questions, and it becomes too much work for one person. This is typically where a company thinks, I know, we'll add a product owner to the mix. So in this model, the product manager works with the trio and they do all the discovery work co-creating with customers. They hand off, which should be a red flag, um, all their discovery learnings to the product owner and the product owner translates that into product requirements that then go to the engineering team. Okay, what do we do here? Well, first of all, we introduced a handoff, right? The product trio is now handing off a bunch of work to the product owner. Um, we also just added a step where we're further removing the engineers from the discovery process, which we don't want to do because we're making them mercenaries and not missionaries. Um, and the other thing that we did is we just kind of created a crummy job. If I'm that product owner and I don't get to engage with customers, I don't get to make any decisions about what to build, all I'm doing is I'm kind of like an assembly line worker, I'm taking input from the trio, I'm translating it to requirements and handing it off to the team. That's not a very fun job. You're going to see high turnover, you're going to see apathetic employees, and you're going to see your junior people grow out of this role pretty quickly. Um, good people are not going to tolerate this role for more than a few months. So this is not the way to solve this problem. What you want to do instead is you want to move from a project-based discovery model towards a more continuous discovery model. 
So what that means is the product trio is still co-creating with customers. They're iterating through prototypes. They're running experiments. They're doing interviews. Their, their goal in co-creating with customers is how do we take the customer's knowledge and context about their own context and combine it with the product trio's knowledge of what's possible with technology and co-create the best solution given both um, groups knowledge. Now you can see here that the engineers aren't positioned off to the right. We actually want to bring them as close to the discovery work as possible. That means when they're available and they have time, they should be coming to our interviews. They should be part of our experiment designs. They should be helping us with prototypes. Now, of course, they still need to do the delivery work and we need a way to communicate. Here's what we're building and why, not just here's some requirements, go be a mercenary for us. So in this model, we're using the same prototypes that we're using with our customers to communicate requirements to our engineering team. When we communicate requirements with prototypes instead of requirements, documents, or user stories, we're able to communicate complexity much easier. We're also gonna use the same types of artifacts that we used in discovery to synthesize what we're learning, opportunity solution trees, customer journey maps, interview snapshots, to communicate with our engineers why we're building what we're building. This additional context, first of all, we're not writing anything new. We're taking the same things that we were creating to do our discovery work to communicate our discovery work. So that product manager isn't getting overloaded doing two jobs. And two, we're giving our engineers the context they need to answer their own questions, to make better decisions about how to implement something, how to design the data model. They have the same context the product trio has so they're now empowered to be missionary teams. So if you're finding that your company is starting to slip down this um, slope of looking at, hey, maybe we need product managers and product owners, or you're not really sure if you're a product manager or a product owner, hopefully these different models will help you start, start to put into context. And the vast majority of time when a company, times when a company feels like they need both roles, it's usually because they're still stuck in this project-based discovery model where they have one foot in the old waterfall traditional um, product management model and one foot in this more customer-centric discovery model. And because they're trying to do both jobs, it's just slogging them down. So what I really encourage those teams to do and those companies to do is to look at how do they take that step, that foot out of the traditional model and step fully into a continuous discovery model. All right. I would love to hear your feedback on this. Feel free to comment on YouTube, um, to reach out on Twitter. Um, if you're new to my work, I have over 200 free articles on continuous discovery at producttalk.org. We also offer a number of skill-based discovery courses at learn.producttalk.org, um, and we'll be releasing more videos like this in the coming weeks.